Hello, and welcome to the very first episode of the Engineering Student Experience Podcast. My name is Paul Nissenson, and I'm an associate professor in the Mechanical Engineering Department at California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, or as we like to call it, Cal Poly Pomona. In this series, I will explore various topics that are relevant to current engineering students and potential future engineering students through interviews with people who have first-hand experience. This episode is all about what to expect during the first few years of entering the workforce, which is what most engineers do immediately after earning their bachelor's degree. The day-to-day -day operations at an engineering job are very different compared to what is required of an engineering student at a university. In school, students are frequently required to take exams, solve carefully laid out textbook problems, and complete projects that are limited in scope and difficulty simply because the academic term is so short just 10 weeks for a university using a quarter system or 15 weeks for a university using a semester system. Real world engineering problems are often open-ended and may take months or even years to complete. Recently, I was able to sit down and have a conversation with a couple former students of mine named Matt DeSalvio and Don Logston. Matt and Don graduated about four years ago from Cal Poly Pomona, each earning a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. They provided a lot of insight into the mind of a junior engineer. I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, well, today I am sitting next to Matt DeSalvio and Don Logsdon. We're going to have a conversation about what it's like once you leave college, that kind of scary time or potentially scary time for, for those of those students who are uh, still in college. Um, welcome to the program, first of all. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Thanks. Appreciate um, it. That's great. Um, so maybe we can start by you telling us a little bit about um, where you're currently at. So what uh, what company do you work for? What's your position there? And what's uh, average day like for Matt and Don? Maybe Matt can go first. So, well, first of all, I graduated in, I believe, 2014, although now I'm questioning myself. 2014 <laughs> sounds about right. And, and just for the listeners out there, this is a recording in January 2018. So it's about three and a half years? Yeah. Okay. Sounds about right. So I graduated in uh, d uh, 2014 and I went to work for Siemens. So I've, for them, I work in their building automation division. I've been doing that about three years now, um, give or take. And what we do is we take you know, dumb air conditioners and make them all work together to control a building and hopefully gather as few temperature complaints in the process yeah. as possible. <laughs> Sometimes a fool's errand, but you can you can always try. Great. Cool. And uh, so my name is Don Logsdon. I uh, also graduated 2014. Matt and I actually uh, worked together on a few projects. We were in the same classes. Uh, anyway, uh, so I actually started with an internship before graduating in uh, 2013 is when I started for a company called Gerdau. Uh, it's a steel manufacturing company and uh, the particular plant that I'm at is a hot roll mill. Uh, they uh, not only melt scrap metal, but they uh, turn it into billets and then roll it into rebar. And so specifically, our plant just makes rebar. And since 2013, I started as an intern, uh, worked for about a year, graduated and then transitioned straight into a full-time position from there. And so currently, I'm what they call a routine facilitator, which basically is kind of a process engineer uh, overlooking the manufacturing process. And so I, from the day-to-day, -day, will do failure analysis when there's any kind of interruptions or failures of the equipment. Uh, also, any kind of improvements to the process, uh, I kind of overlook and, and try to um, design ways to make the process more efficient and uh, streamlined. And so sometimes that involves training, uh, creating procedures for the machine operators and things like that. So that's, it's been about four years or so now uh, I've been mm. working for them. Dealing with heavy metal, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so yeah, for us it's, uh, even though rebar sounds boring, it's actually, there's a lot that goes into it mm. for sure. So I'm gonna take you guys back all the way to high school now, if you can remember that far back, that would have been what, eight years yeah. ago, roughly? Yeah, and you're about I, to... I graduated high school in 2008. Okay. So. Yeah, oh. it was actually 2007. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 10 years ago, roughly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully you remember this far back. I was just wondering back then, 
Did you have any idea what engineers did or what level of knowledge did you have about engineers and specifically mechanical engineering because you both got degrees in mechanical engineering? Because um, I anticipate a lot of people who are going to be listening to this are, are high school students and mm -hmm. they hear engineer and they might think of uh, trains or they might have a family member who's an engineer. Mm -hmm. So if you guys can remember, what did you guys know about engineering back then? Well, I can tell you this. My entire college career, I never um, took a single class that taught me anything about driving a train. So that was a little <laughs> disappointing for me. Well, I guess we failed you. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's. It, I should have checked the correct box on the, uh, on the application. But, you know, engineering is kind of a hard thing to pin down. Just because the engineering that I do is, in a lot of ways, so wildly different than the engineering that's taught in classes and the engineering that other engineers go into. And there's like, it is such a wide spectrum there in a lot of cases. So it can be tough to kind of figure out what to explain to people. And to be honest, I didn't really know exactly what it was that engineers did, but I had a feeling that it's what I wanted to do. It, it, when I was in high school, I loved to make stuff. Mm. And for me, engineering was the way to make stuff better. Mm. And that's been taking me through ever since. Mm. And what kind of stuff did you used to make? Oh, I made everything from, uh, from little robots to, to furniture to, you know, prototypes of inventions that I've been, you know, 3d printing and things like that. Um, is everything. I wanted to make everything. I wanted to be in a position where anything that came along, I could handle it. So if I needed to, you know, do some plumbing, I could do some plumbing. If I needed to do some electrical, I could do some electrical. If I needed to take a nice picture, I could take a nice picture. Um, but, you know, engineering for me on the, on the making side of things uh, has always been the it's been the, the math behind it to make sure that I didn't have to make it twice. So, Don, when you were um, in high school, what did, what did you know about engineering? So, for me, it was pretty similar to what Matt said, uh, but I'd say maybe a little bit more toward the how things work was, was what I kind of interpreted. So, rather than how to build, just kind of how everything works mm. in the world. Um, and so, physics fascinated me. And that's kind of where it started, uh, just seeing, you know, Newtonian physics was, was super fascinating and just how everything should act uh, and then also how things are made. And so I guess I kind of got to, got to see that now with rebar specifically, but um, that's kind of how I envisioned it being. And so I guess in a way it was what I thought it was. But I know that, like Matt said, it's a lot to actually take it because there's a lot of different categories and spectrums when it comes to engineering, it feels. Cause especially mechanical engineering is a very broad uh, field. And so you can really get into so many different things and see so many fields uh, within just mechanical engineering. Yeah. So now you enter university, enter college, and you're a freshman. Okay. How, how is that Don and Matt as a freshman? How did that person evolve as a student from freshman all the way to, to 2014 when you guys finally graduated? Well, I had to learn how to study mm. in between there because I never had to do that in, you know, high school English. It was always just, I just remembered it. And then I got to, you know, calculus and you know calculus 2 and calculus 3 and all the other calculus based classes after that and you just can't remember all of that it's just too much information and with engineering specifically every class kind of builds upon the next um, so if you don't like my biggest regret in college all of college was not learning how to integrate better <laughs> so in all of the classes 
after calculus where I had to do tough integrals, I couldn't do them. And it was a huge sticking point for me and it caused me to miss a lot of points on tests because I've made mistakes. It caused me to spend a lot more time on my homework and on my exams. And at the time, it felt right to me because I got through calculus. That class is over, but it didn't go away. Mm. It kept coming back in every single engineering class after that. It was, oh yeah, just take the integral of that. And I'm like, yeah, that. I think my calculator can do that or I'll Google it. Yeah, so any, any high school students out there, you hear that? You, you need to pay attention during uh, calculus. Exactly, calculus integral. is important. Yeah. And, you know, it's some of the most important things that I learned in college were, were calculus and programming. Hmm. And, you know, programming for me, I don't care what your major is. You need to learn how to program hmm. in some language. So is there any language based on your experience that you'd recommend people to try to pick up? My personal favorite is Visual Basic. Okay. And the reason is because, I mean, you come from the university world. We both come from the corporate world. Are you allowed to just install anything you want on your computer? No. <laughs> Not, nothing exactly. but Excel, pretty much. <laughs> Bingo. And Visual Basic for applications is built into Excel. Mm, yep. So no matter where you work, if you've got Microsoft Office, you can program in this language. And what that allows you to do is take the things that you have to do that are just tedious and offload it to a computer which has 100% accuracy all the time and can do it much faster than you can. So instead of solving a problem once and then when it comes up again, solving it again at considerable cost of time, solve it one time and make it go away forever and then you're free to, to focus on the things that you have to focus on. You don't have to type in these numbers or whatever yeah yeah the tedium yeah exactly I'd, I'd, I'd totally agree with that and it, no shameless plug intended but uh, I actually had Dr. Nissenson for VBA um, oh, did here you? yeah and uh, and I still use it same same thing I'd say that's definitely been the most useful uh, yeah. programming language for sure so you're that saying I've that used. I'm I'm responsible for you uh, having a successful career so far so you're far saying, right? yeah okay. exactly that's it's all I mean in in VBA I've done everything from a simple macro to entire graphical user interfaces. One example I had specifically was I did, uh, you know, I'm in building automation controls and part of that sometimes is lighting control. So I did a lighting control project and as part of the uh, checkout process and the permitting process, I had to give them a settings report of all the little settings that I had in there. You know how many settings go into a lighting control program? One. Uh, no, <laughs> close. Yeah, well, <laughs> I contacted the manufacturer of these things and asked them for their software, how do I export this? And they said, it's in development, which means you can't. But using a little clever hacking around, I found out how to read the save file on my own hmm. and had it automatically populate into an Excel spreadsheet, which I could then send. This thing was like 40 columns by 400 rows on two different sheets. You think I would have typed that right if I did it all manually? No way. It would have taken me three times longer than programming it, and I would have done it wrong. That's true. Made a mistake somewhere. Exactly. You can't. No human person can type in that many cells without making a mistake. It's yeah. just not possible. Yeah. So, for me, the way I changed from the way, when I started to when I finished was, you know, to recognize that it's not going to go away. You can't just put it off and hope, you know, put your head under the, under the blankets and, you know, hope the storm passes you because a lot of those things will come back. And so make sure you learn it right the first time. And also that programming is so important, especially in this computer day and age that we have now. It's, it's everywhere. And it's not going to become less important over time. Probably, exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So mm -hmm. that was some of the biggest things for me that I learned in school. Mm. How about you, Don? How did you evolve as a, as a student? Um, I'd say my biggest evolution was definitely learning how to learn. I, I'd say that was the biggest change for me because I definitely remember being a freshman coming in, regurgitating what the teachers or professors were, were teaching and just really taking the tests and doing the homework and everything just to do it. Uh, really not absorbing or... Um, 
taking it into myself for my own edification. Mm. Uh, but as time went on, I started realizing that I'm in school for me. I'm in school to better myself and I'm paying for it too. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, if you get scholarships or something, you might not realize, but the, the sacrifices that are made to go to school really illustrate the importance of taking advantage of every, every opportunity that you have mm. to learn and grow. And so after a few years, I kind of started picking up the fact that, hey, like this, this is something that I want to do and I want to learn and I want to improve. And the more I put in, the more I get out, basically. Mm. And so, and then from there, it really absolutely applies to life outside of school because then when you're in the workplace almost no matter where you go there's going to be new things that you're going to have to learn and things that no one trained you on no one had the time to stop and teach you you have to learn yourself and uh, of course i mean google is a nice crutch uh, a lot of us use but but in general there's going to be things that you can't learn from google either you, you got to know how to learn you, you have to do it independently and uh, and really just pick it up as you go you know and mm -hmm. so I think that that that's been something that's really helped me since you know I've been a freshman and and I slowly learned that and so now when you're put in a different position even at the same uh, job you may be working at or the same uh, company there's several executives in my company that have gone from, you know, the HR side to engineering or vice versa. And um, I actually started in the, uh, actually the more technical side where I would spend probably 90% of my time working specifically on improvement projects, doing data analysis, which was more the stereotypical engineering type job. But then uh, actually about a year and a half ago, I had the opportunity to go to a more like management type role uh, where the technical knowledge is still needed, but it's more geared toward managing uh, actual operators and, and, uh, and kind of dealing more with people and having those soft skills rather than the technical skills. And so that's, that's something I've kind of had to adjust to. And because I've, I've kind of been learning how to learn, it, it helped me adapt. And so I, I feel like that's something that's really important that I've kind of picked up over the years now. And, and of course, you know, I have a long way to go in a lot of ways, but still that once you learn how to learn, you can really go anywhere. Yeah. So Don already mentioned um, how he had an internship. And uh, I know Matt also had an internship. And so I was wondering if you could uh, discuss the importance of internship and in getting you to where you're at today. So for me, one of the most important aspects of having an internship was that it gave me a, the flavor of the real world in a way that I didn't really get in my classes. Because as we all know, academia and, you know, life, they are two different things. So as an example, when you're in an engineering class or any class for that matter, when you're solving a problem out of the textbook, it's a given that all the information you need to solve that problem is there in the textbook. It's either part of the problem statement, or it's part of the tables in the back of the book, or you need an equation from the chapter that's immediately before that question in the book, something of that nature. But real life is nothing like that. Somebody's gonna, you know, give you a part that's, you know, somehow not to spec, and they're gonna say, how did this happen? How do we prevent it? And we need to ensure, not only how do we prevent it, but we need to ensure that it is prevented uh, as like a corrective action. And you go over there and you're looking at the, you know, the machine that made the part or the, the tooling that made the part. You just kind of scratch your head like, I don't know, it's, it's bad. But then you kind of have to dig in and pull together the pieces from life that made that part bad and identify them and and get rid of them so this can be for me it was a real big challenge because you know i just never had any practice with that yeah. before and 
especially because in the real world as an engineer, you are a value added employee, right? You are generating information. And you, the, the, the things that you're generating the information for are eventually rolled into products, which are eventually sold to customers. In Don's case with the rebar, that rebar needs to be strong enough to hold whatever freeway it goes into together. And if it's not, that's a huge problem. Uh, when I was doing my internship, we made automotive parts. So if that part didn't have all of the nuts it needed in it, well, guess what? Now the automotive assembly line has to stop. And they have to get a new part over there. That's a huge problem too. So your customers are expecting a certain level of quality from you and you have to find ways to achieve that. And there's really no textbook way to do that. Hmm. So that was, that was the hardest part for me on uh, being, an, uh, being an intern. Hmm. They gave you a nice taste of what it was like to, to yes, see what the yes, real Because like. you yeah. end up it, in school, you're in a... I think of it like like a room, right? In class, you're in a very carefully lit room where all the information is known. Mm -hmm. And you just have to go to whatever corner of the room the information you need is and grab it. Okay, well, the in real life, it's a very much larger room and it's very dimly lit. <laughs> and in order to navigate from one side to the other, you have to sort of find your own way to make a map of the space. Yeah. And it's nowhere near as carefully laid out as it is, you know, in, in the classroom. Yeah. And sometimes you don't even know if it's in the room at all. Exactly. Yeah, yeah it might so, not even exist. <clears throat> you, you have unknown variables that cannot yeah. be known. Exactly. And those, is, those things are just the lovely wrench in the works that sometimes, you know, you don't know. Yeah. So, so. the engineer has to be the, the treasure hunter in the... Uh, Dimly lit room. Exactly. I like exactly. that analogy. Yeah. It's and a lot of times I feel myself just fumbling around, trying to orient myself in the right direction, and you know, de defining the problem first becomes hugely important mm. because, like I said in the book, it's a very carefully written thing. But when somebody dumps a part on your desk and says this thing doesn't work, figure out why and make sure it never happens again. Well, that's a very vague yeah. thing. And you've got to first figure out, what even do I have to do here? And then you have to find a way to pull in all the information you need to do it. And then you have to do it. Yeah. And then from the, you know, the instructor side, the side that I'm coming from, we're tasked with in, in a quarter system, which we're at, mm -hmm. at Cal Poly Pomona. In 10 weeks, we have to give you, you know, teach you, 15 things exactly and we only uh, get to meet for a total of maybe um, I don't know 30 hours and then we only we, we have to test you periodically mm -hmm. and yeah it's it's maybe the whole structure is yeah, uh, and those 15 things by the way are not a small 15 things it's not like it's I have been to a teach career you. on each of them <laughs> exactly it's not like I'm teaching you 15 different letters of the alphabet it's like I'm teaching you 15 different languages sometimes oh yeah just give you a flavor of the different topics exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, how are internships uh, for you, Don? How are internships um, important for you? I'd say in a lot of ways it was similar uh, as Matt, but just one other side of it that I've seen not only when I was an intern, but also as I've had the opportunity to hire or uh, interview other people or other entry-level engineers. Really, a big part of it is actually getting to know the work environment and the work environment or company to get to know you as well. And mm. so like for me, I started for about a year part-time my senior year at Cal Poly and it really worked out where they could see my work ethic and my determination and my knowledge. Mm -hmm. and foot, a foot in the door into the company. Exactly. Really, right? They yeah. could see who I was really because you really can't get it too well from an interview. I mean, you can get a little bit, but it's more of a flavor than it is anything else. And so uh, for me, that, that actually did work out where I got my foot in the door and transitioned directly into a full-time position. And so uh, in that case, it was a really great tool for finding a job right after college. 
And I actually found the internship in the first place through the, um, the Cal Poly uh, Career Center, actually, okay. as it turns out. I, I went to the website, and they had a list of internships, and I just found one that seemed kind of interesting, applied, and got it. And so it was kind of cool that I, I can actually say I'm a success story through the school, um, getting a job uh, through the Career Center and transitioning out of school you know, pretty seamlessly. Um, but, uh, but again, even when I've interviewed entry-level engineers, I definitely look for those individuals that have done internships because you really mm. can see a difference in their maturity, really, I feel, because they understand what really happens compared to the theory in school. Uh, like Matt said, it's totally different things. And so you kind of see that they, they understand that their calculations are going to be a big important part of the process, but there's still a lot of real life things that you can't necessarily control. A lot of uh, a lot more variables than just the you know small classroom full of them, and so that that's been something that I've seen, and it worked worked really well for me. So when you've been uh, when you're hiring new engineers, is that one of the top things that you look for? Or uh, what other characteristics might you look for for, for um, people who want to, to join your company? Honestly, I, w I would say that is one of the top things. I feel like mm -hmm. it's more important than the GPA, even though that, you know, is something you look at. It's not as important that someone got good grades. Because I've actually seen several individuals that they had great grades. Mm -hmm. But when you really talk to them and got to know them, they were not teachable, for example. Okay. Where you you might um, mention some way that they could improve, and they take it defensively, you know, and then they cut themselves off from the learning experience. And mm -hmm. you, I feel like you actually see a better, uh, I guess, openness to being teachable from those who are, have had internships because they realize this is I'm at the bottom here. I don't really know so much and so i'm gonna be as open as possible you know mm. and and a lot of the time we kind of get big heads when we come out of school because we're like oh yeah we know everything and the truth is there's an infinite amount of knowledge out there and we know a tiny fraction when we get out of school yeah have you been part of any kind of hiring process matt i've been loosely involved in it i mean i can say that one of the biggest things for me is that you should know what you're talking about. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you shouldn't be talking about it, right? So flesh it out, do some research before you, before you bring it up or, or whatever. But if, in my company specifically, troubleshooting ability is a huge part of what we do. So, and in order to troubleshoot things, you have to know how it works. So an example that I can um, that I can remember off the top of my head was we were looking at interviewing a new engineer, and one of the things he had mentioned on his resume that said he made a you know he had a particular automation project that he had done uh, for his own enjoyment, and in that he used a particular type of pump, a very specific type of pump. So my question that I asked during the uh, interviewing process was, you know, I said I'm not familiar with that type of pump. Can you tell me? how it works. What does it do to pump the liquid? And this particular individual didn't have the answer to that question, which to me meant that if there were a problem with that pump, which there is a, a, you know, a litany of things that could go wrong with it, you wouldn't know where to start looking. Mm. So that's, that's huge in, in a lot of ways to, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to bring it up, you should know what it is. And but for me, I, I, I've been only very lightly involved in the hiring process, but I can speak to my own hiring. And I know that, um, to Don's point, my career started out okay and then was in a holding pattern. I plateaued for a good two, three months while I thought I knew everything. And it and then I had this epiphany moment at some point several months into my career where I realized I don't know anything. 
there's so much about this career that I have no idea about. And there's all these people who are trying to teach me and I haven't been listening to them. Hmm. And once I realized that, I really started to take off after that. And that was a huge realization. And for me, before that moment, it was almost unfathomable to think that after spending, you know, I, I was in school for six years. After spending six years learning that I wasn't done yet. And I started after that point to regard my degree as not so much a, a certification of how much I know, but a certification of what I'm capable of learning. Hmm. So I look at it now as a ticket of this particular individual is certified to be able to learn whatever you have to teach him in order to be good at his job. And I haven't looked back since, and it's done well for me so far. Mm. So just recognize that you don't know everything. You're still learning. It's just a different phase of your learning process and treat it accordingly. So w when you made that realization, was there any kind of, um, I don't know, self-confidence issues or, or anything that came along with that? Because now you realize that you don't know anywhere near as much as the people around you. And um, were you afraid of being like found out or something? Or uh, there's this famous thing called the imposter syndrome where you're always yeah. constantly worried about people finding out that y you don't know as much as, as um, as, as everyone else. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I was, I mean, I had a very good mentor from the start. And the point at which I realized that I didn't know everything was the point at which I realized that everybody else but me knew that already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have any self-confidence issues after that because I knew that everybody else knew that I was learning. It was expected. It's a part of the process. Exactly. I was not expected to come in out of school and take the company to new heights and really come up with that thing that's really going to save this particular proposal or anything like that. I was just there to learn so that in two years' time, I could start to pull my own weight. And that's really in, that's about how long it took me to get to the point where I could be on my own, producing revenue for the company was almost two years before mm. I felt confident doing that without having to make a phone call every about 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounded like for Don, the transition was a little more seamless from, uh, from graduation and say for through your first six months, but did you have any kind of issues that came up while you were transitioning to to being working full time at that company and yeah absolutely I, i'd actually say it was right along the same lines okay. as matt um, the internship i feel actually i guess is one other benefit that i kind of forgot about to mention before is it definitely actually built my uh confidence for sure at least in that it it showed me that kind of the same thing that people were willing to wait for me to learn and they understood that it wouldn't be immediate that I would be producing these amazing things. And I could, but at the same time, I could accomplish a lot more than I thought I could. And so after the first year being an intern, I feel like that's when I kind of, I gained a little bit of confidence, but not too much because I still knew that I was far from delivering the kind of successful work that most employees would, especially the ones I'd seen that are like 30 years there and things like that. But as as time went on, probably about two years, I'd, I'd agree as well, uh, it felt like I became more and more confident and more and more comfortable, at least with being who I am, basically. Uh, being an engineer, being uh, a manager, being uh, wherever I am at that point. And so, of course, you, you never stop learning and there's always going to be more to improve on. But the uh, it seems like the first couple years are just a little bit tricky because you, you definitely want to already be there. You want to be perfect even. 
but it takes it takes time and experience and i feel like the experience is what really drives home the confidence mm-hmm. like as you've experienced it maybe even a hundred times i feel like because maybe as an example um so there's there's quite a bit of machinery that you know it, this is heavy machinery that ver- could be very dangerous if you're not careful and so even though i'd been around it for maybe three years I just still didn't know really how to operate it myself. There's machine operators that do that, and so I would, you know, observe them, and of course manage, however best I could. But when it came to actually, if if they were gone and I had to just operate the machine, could I do it? And the answer was no, until I finally was like, you know what, this is something that I want to do. And I put my mind to it. And then after doing it a bunch of times, now I, I feel confident. And so um, I feel like just doing something a bunch of times for some reason just seems to give you confidence. And so it's like a, a continual process um, as you work at a particular job to do an activity enough times and then you feel comfortable. Hmm. So you said it took about... Yeah, a couple of years for both of you. A couple of years to mm-hmm. finally feel like you're being productive. How long did it take you before you felt like you belonged in the company, part of this sort of family, and 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 had that kind of camaraderie with your your coworkers? It was it about the same kind of time frame? The for me, the camaraderie was a little bit um, was a little bit faster coming than the than the ability to perform, or what I perceived to be the ability. To perform, uh, there were in my company there were several people who brought on around the same time, so there was a certain amount of commiseration going on there, with the, oh what are you working on oh man I can't believe it I I don't know how to do that you should show me, yeah, that sort of stuff. So there's a there's a, a little group of people who've been there around the same time as I have, but then as I advanced, I realized that I was starting to become the expert in areas. Mm-hmm. There were things, the new things that came along that got handed to me to figure out because I didn't know anything anyway, so I might as well know, and nobody else knows it, so why not that guy? So I you know, picked these things up, and then you start getting phone calls from people who have been around much longer than you who need some assistance with this particular expertise area that you have, and you start to build your relationships that way. And it, it also comes back to that... You don't know everything, but you do know some things. Nobody knows everything. We have one particular employee comes to mind, just retired. He'd been with the company 25, 30 years. This guy, if you had a problem, this guy knew how to fix it. It's a lot of knowledge that left the company. Exactly. And we tried to to get as much of it scraped together (laughs) into our own hands as we could before he left. But he would call me on occasion. For help on something because there were things even this expert guy who if he came out to your job site you knew it was just you were good it was going to get taken care of now because this guy's here he would still call because he knew what he knew and he knew what he didn't know and he knew who did know those things uh, maybe that sounds a little bit confusing but know what you know know what you don't know and know where you can get that information yeah. It becomes very important, and that's the camaraderie with your coworkers becomes very important at that stage because, you know, you're going to need help. You are going to need help, and you are going to make mistakes, and you're going to have to fix them. Yeah, and I don't know if this this sounds like common sense, but it's kind of funny because I remember starting out needing a lot of help and asking others in the company to help me out with all kinds of things. Uh, from HR issues to tech, uh, IT issues. Mm-hmm. And yeah, exactly like you said, I would, at least at first, I didn't really have that feel for the the teamwork and the camaraderie um, that they enjoyed, the other members of the company. And so I might shoot an email to someone and say, hey, could you do this? Or hey, could you do that? And then I, I started realizing that that was a, a terrible way to to really make friends 
And then I started realizing, well, you know what? I could ask someone how their day is first, you know, and, and really see how they're doing. And, and from there, it, it really does not only build a relationship, but it makes people want to work together. It, it builds that teamwork. And so now, like you said, everyone's kind of working together to accomplish this bigger goal of improving the company or making something more efficient. And we always can accomplish so much more that way. And so now you kind of can see the, the difference in effectiveness that, that each individual has by being able to rely on each other and ask for help from each other. Mm. And so I feel like that's definitely, um, once you get to that point where people are relying on you and you're relying on them, that you kind of feel like you're a, a work company, a company family, kind of. Yeah, I mean, as a manager, it's all about managing people, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, ha having those soft skills are incredibly important. Yeah, and I think a lot of times in engineering, people skills are kind of put by the wayside. I don't think we really develop those at all, or there's not there's yeah. not enough room in the curriculum for it. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there's. There's so much math and so much other stuff that it's kind of expected. Well, hopefully you know how to talk to people because here's some math that you're going to have to explain to somebody someday. And if people, it's, when, when you think about like, if you watch a movie about an engineer or something, it's some guy in a cubicle never talks to anybody and just does his work. He's on his computer and that's it and he leaves. The real world's not that way. That's not a fulfilling life. You have to, there's a lot of communication that goes on. Some days I spend more time on my phone than I do on my computer. And my computer is what I get paid to do. That's my money maker. So there's a lot of mentoring. There's a lot of gathering information. There's a lot of transmitting information to the people who need to know. Because ultimately, whatever I'm doing, we need to be making money on. And if there's reasons why I'm, ha I'm being set back or something like that, that needs to be communicated. If there's pro progress that I've made that was unexpected progress, that needs to be communicated to the project management team as well. So there's a lot of interpersonal communication, which I'm sure you have as well, especially in management. Oh, yeah, definitely. In fact, I remember when I first started, they had basically a management training program for two years, actually, where they'd get the uh, pretty much all the entry-level engineers from around the country, uh, and they would have us all convene at one location and do team building it exercises and things like that and at first I thought this is really a waste of time basically like I had the engineering mindset you know I want to just get to work do some some data analysis or something but interestingly as time went on I started to see the value in knowing your personality type I'm an ISTJ you know <laughs> like that, that guy's you know whatever the the particular test is but uh, you start to realize that you can really not only bond with people, but work better together when you see your strengths versus their strengths and complement each other. Because there's some individuals that you may butt heads with, but once you really get to know who they are, they can be your greatest asset. Mm. And, and I've seen that myself. Uh, I had, in fact, my mentor, while I was an intern, he was very kind of eccentric. He did things he always did things different than everyone else did and the the amazing thing is he would come up with the best ideas because he just saw things from this big perspective and i i was more of a processor like if he gave me something to do i'd get it done but we we actually could work together really well because he could think of the ideas but a lot of the time he'd kind of move on to something else he, he wouldn't really push it through to completion but he could give it to me and i'd i'd get it done and so uh, that's just one example of, you know, how those soft skills can be very useful. So how much, speaking about communication, how much of your day is taken up with writing, like writing reports, writing maybe manuals, emails? How much of your day do you think is spent on actually writing? I write a lot less than I communicate over the phone because okay. I'm in... I'm in a field type position. I'm not a typical suit and tie engineer. I'm a polo shirt, jeans, and steel toed boots type of engineer. Same here. And, you know, so I'm out there in the dirt by myself, the only one from my company within 10 miles, sometimes within 100 miles. 
So a lot of the uh, a lot of the things I had to communicate are over the phone, but uh, writing most of the notes that I have uh, is for me. Most of the writing I do is for me, and you'll notice every day here it is right here. He's pulling out a little little booklet. This is oh. my little notebook, and everything I have to write I have in here. Like here here's an example. This here is a it's a diagram I drew of a, of a fan coil air conditioning unit that I had I had to figure it out. And now I've got this. So next time I have to wire a 208 volt fan coil unit, I've got the diagram of how to do it. And I had this big epiphany one time that I'm going to make all these little notes in all these little places and I'm going to lose them and I'm going to think, oh man, how did I wire that 208 volt unit? Well, I've got, uh, I've gone through one of these a year. <laughs> How many pages, sir? Oh, I don't know. There's a good 60 something pages in okay. here. Okay. So, but these, this is where all my little notes go. And when I'm done with it, I write the date that I finished it. And that goes into my little file. And I can search back through these books and find a note that I wrote two years ago of some little critical piece of information. Matt, do not forget this. Because, oh man, you're going to be in trouble if you do. Yeah. And I'm able to go back and find it. So that's where my writing comes in. And of course, there's the, always the failure analysis reports of why did, why was there no air conditioning in the courthouse on this particular day? What was, what was the root cause? There's those types of reports that go in too. Um, but for me, I communicate visually the sort of the same way I do verbally so it, it saves me a step a lot of times to do it over the phone so for those engineers that are back at the office how much writing do you estimate that they do or do you have any kind of reference well uh, I have done a fair amount of office work and okay. what we do what our office engineers do is they're putting together the control systems so they don't write so much as they diagram we have a submittal package that we release for a project. And in that submittal package, the meat, in, there's all the, of course, all the spec sheets for all the components and things that we're going to have on the project. So you can look in there and see what it's capable of, what its limitations are. But the, uh, the meat and potatoes of that is the drawings section. The drawings fully define the entire control system. Mm which in this submittal package, just the drawings. I've done, I've done projects that had one drawing, done projects that had 10 drawings. I've done projects that had 70 plus drawings. We have had projects that have had hundreds of drawings. That's how we communicate. So the field people will get the submittal package and everything they need to execute that project is in there. The, you know, all the sequences of operation for the equipment, all the wiring diagrams, all that stuff. So we communicate more with, you know, lines and terminations than we do with words. Mm. How much writing do you do, Don? I'd actually say it's kind of a polar opposite, I guess. Because... <laughs> uh, well, your yeah. management, right? Yeah. It's since... Probably a lot of um, reports on... Uh, on uh, what's the word I'm looking at? Progress reports? Or, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd say it's definitely increased since I went from the more technical side to the, the management side. I would say when I was more technical, it was definitely more drawings and data analysis, but not so much the, the actual, you know, paragraphs of, of writing. But yeah, definitely for now, I mean, sometimes I wish I had a secretary because <laughs> there's so much, but, uh, but I try to actually get on the floor where the, the manufacturing process is happening as much as possible because um, that's really the most value-added portion of my job. So that's, that's mm. what I'm always searching to do. But when I do have to, I mean, there's uh, definitely progress reviews, um, opportunity reports, uh, even time off requests. I mean, there's all kinds of things that... that dealing with people you definitely have to to do even write-ups on occasion uh, sometimes even terminations i mean there's there's all kinds of stuff that um, you have to write a detailed report and also do documentation along the line and that's something that i actually had kind of not really realized would be a, a such an important part of management is documenting everything 
because there's liability if you don't you get sued yeah <laughs> so if you know an employee is doing something they're not supposed to i mean you, you have to document it because you know there could be uh, all kinds of implications if you don't because yeah. then you're you're being negligent yeah then also yeah it protects yourself exactly yeah. but of course i mean the the part that i like to do is is the like performance reviews for new employees and, and things like that so you can really work with people and see you know, where they're improving, where they could use work, um, you know, their aspirations and their questions, you know. So that, that part I really enjoy because I get to help people grow and also kind of grow with them. Hmm. So do you guys encounter any kind of, without, you know, divulging anything about the company or getting you in trouble, do you have to deal with any kind of, uh, like, politics at work? Um, maybe it'd be, it would apply more to Don because he works... Um, maybe more of a closer to an office setting than than Matt does. It sounds like. Yeah, I, I would, I would say there definitely is because, like, just as an example, there's a there's a culture that every company has, uh, and and like, my company has a particular culture that they outline their values, um, and I, I believe it's fairly common for most companies, and so of course you want to follow those values because I mean most of the time they're very very positive things. Uh, like openness or, you know, things like that. But uh, at the same time, of course, not everyone's going to follow the values. And so there's always going to be some kind of, I guess, push and pull when it comes to uh, everyone's perception of each other in in that realm. Even, uh, you know, the other, the other part is, I guess, with the work-life balance portion of being in a full-time position, there's a lot of flexibility a lot of the time when it comes to your hours. At least at, at our company, there can be flexibility on when you come in, when you leave, um, how long your lunch is. You know, they're, they're really the most important part is the results. And so if there's good results, then most of the time no one's going to care what hours you're working. Um, but of course, if those results aren't there, they're going to question, hey, are you putting in the time that you need to? That's something I hadn't really realized as a student because I thought, you know, you, you do your eight to five and that's how the real world works for, for any job. But, uh, but anyway, so when you actually are, are in a job and you're working whatever hours, there is kind of a culture even with, you know, who's there the most, who's there the least, you know, is this person contributing enough? Is that person not contributing? And so that, I would definitely say that there's a, a, a dynamic there of, of politics, you might say, um, because there's, there's always going to be image when you have people involved. Mm -hmm. but, um, but overall, I'd say that the, uh, the goal of most companies, I think, is, and, and I know that minus one is empowerment for the employees, that, that they, they feel like they can and they actually can uh, do the things that they're trying to do without inhibitions. So if they are trying to succeed in a particular aspect of improving a part of the process, they have the power to do that. Of course, with the cost restrictions and things like that, but you don't want to have a culture in which people can't accomplish what they want to accomplish, mm -hmm. you know? like a bureaucracy or things like that. Yeah. Well, speaking of work-life balance, how has that been working out for you guys in the first three to four years? Um, you want to go first? <laughs> well, <laughs> about that, you need to sleep. That's, a, that's an important thing. I found that out. Yeah. Um, also, one thing that a lot of people don't take into account is the amount of time you're going to spend getting to and from work. Uh, sometimes I can be in the I can be in the car for two hours going to work, two hours coming home. Uh, I've dealt with up to three. It can be tough, especially because you'll find that a lot of the world does not work on the on the nine to five schedule. It you need it done. It needs to be working. We need this report. We need to uh, send out this bid. We need to do whatever. There's deadlines, and sometimes those deadlines can be quite short. 
and there's people who will rise to that challenge and sacrifice and make it happen. I hope I'm one of those people. And there's other people who will say, well, we'll deal with it tomorrow. Sometimes it can't be dealt with tomorrow. So it can be tough to, to find that work-life balance. And to be honest with you, I'm still trying to find it. And the, my first three years with the company, I'm you know ashamed to say I haven't really done a very good job of finding that work-life balance. I have worked almost as many hours as I haven't worked <laughs> in some cases. And a lot of late nights and a lot of working on things after I go home. I you know, pull out the computer again and look over the code and do this sort of stuff. And that's, that's been one of my biggest challenges in my career so far is to, to find the line where work ends and life begins because it's a very blurry line sometimes. Yeah, even, even from the academia side, which is where I'm coming from, um, I'm definitely putting in more than 40 hours a week for sure uh, during the school year. Uh, now, I'm, I'm lucky that I get the summers off and I can choose to work or not work during yeah. that time. I often choose to work on projects. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's even a problem for, for instructors as well. It's, I think it's a problem everywhere, to be honest with you, because wherever you find people who want to be their best, you will find people who are pushing the envelope and putting in an extra hour to learn something new or make that report just that much better or really fix up this spreadsheet show it so it shows what you want to see um, and it filters out some of the noise. That's always there. And sometimes you have to realize that good enough is good enough. Mm-hmm. And the, <clears throat> you can get it next time. You can... You have to learn how to let go of a project. You'll, you'll never be done. You'll never be done with That's your true. projects. Mm-hmm. Um, because everything can always be made better. But you have to realize that at some point, this will serve the purpose. Um, it'll be good enough. And... That's where I'm going to have to leave it. Yeah, maybe like this podcast, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, I definitely had a lot of questions about that when I first started. Fortunately for for us in in the company, they actually had an entire training on that in our management training program. Um, so I felt really lucky to have that program because it kind of um, helped us transition into that and and kind of try to find a balance early on. And I, I don't know if you know, I've, I've still got some, uh, maybe balance issues, but one thing that really helped me was my first boss, I guess you might say, or supervisor actually would always say, work hard, play hard. And, uh, and so he, he set this culture of you put in 150% when you're, when you're there, you're doing everything you can. You're not wasting time you know, shooting the breeze in the office or anything like that. But then when it's whatever time is the balance for you, whether that's, you know, maybe eight to five, but maybe it's, you know, eight to six or maybe it's seven to four or whatever it is, you cut it off and yeah, you say, okay, that's, that's enough for today. I put, I, I left it on the field basically, just like in any sport, you you do the best you can. And when it's done, you just leave it and you go, home and play hard you know and then you can do whatever you you want to do and so that's really helped me that philosophy I guess you might call it uh but uh but I I know it's definitely different for everyone it really just depends on each person and their their life their needs um, their family and uh, as they I think as they kind of try to find that balance of, of perfectionism, but still having their, their life at home, I think that's when you know, it, it really works out. So we've talked a lot about how college is not like the real world, um, but in what ways did it help prepare you for the real world? And was there anything that it got right besides the fact that 
these equations actually work to some extent in the real world. One thing I took away from college was that um, it's, it's not necessarily what you know, it's what you know how to find out. And the thing that I liked most about college was that it gave me such a wide-ranging flavor for so many things. And I have now in my head a little nugget of information that says, hey, maybe you should look into this. Maybe you should find out about that. So when I have to do something involving heat transfer, I know where I can go look to find out, is this going to work? Is it not going to work? And uh, it was a humongous resource for me. Uh, I was lucky enough to be able to buy all of my textbooks outright. And I have a very burdened bookshelf at home. It's actually sagging quite a bit that has my textbooks on it. And I kept them. And the reason I did that, even though it cost more, was that I knew that one day I would probably want to look back at, you know, my strength materials textbook or, you know, as an example, you know, you got to design a spring for whatever. When was the last time you designed a spring? It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can look back and see, oh, here's the chapter on spring design, right? I know that there are ways to design a spring because I learned them in machine mm -hmm. design, right? Do I have them right here? If you sat me down with the machine design test and gave me a calculator and one sheet of notes, could I do it? Probably not, but I know where to look to get that information now, and yeah. that was huge. Yeah, actually, just yesterday I was preparing some lecture notes for a, for a course, and I needed to know something about a, a particular method of solving um, ordinary differential equations, and yeah, I pulled out a book from my bookshelf that's at least 15, 16 years old, and, and it was like, oh, that's exactly what I needed. And there's no way I remembered that information off the top of my head, but just having yeah, those you can. resources available, you can at least know where to get the information relatively exactly. quickly. Exactly. Yeah. It's not what you know. It's what you know how to find out. Yeah. Definitely. And I I would totally concur with that. I, uh, I know that for me... I guess going back to what I said before, realizing that you can really learn anything is a huge asset, knowing that it doesn't really matter what you end up facing. Uh, school teaches you that you can learn anything. It just takes time. It just takes the effort, and you can succeed. And so uh, that's definitely, I think, one of the most useful things that I learned in school, for sure. Mm. So... You guys got your bachelor's degree in uh, mechanical engineering. Do you guys have any future plans to go for anything higher based on um, maybe the kind of career options it would give you to get, say, like a master's degree, for example? I think a master's degree is pretty much always a good idea. Um, it's one, uh, one extra feather in your hat. You can either go you know, directly into uh, an engineering master if that will help you grow your career, you can go into, you, you can get an MBA if you want to end up in a position to have your own business or your own engineering firm. Sometimes that can be a great asset to know how to make money at doing engineering because it's really easy in engineering to say, I need a beam that's three feet thick and then I'll definitely be good. But then there's the other side of the coin of like, how much money do you think we have for this project? No, 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 no. Will 18 inches work? Yeah, yeah, it'll work. 18 inches. So there's, there's different sides to that coin. I don't think more learning is ever really a bad thing. It can make sure you don't let yourself get into a rut and spend too long in school. So that way, when you go into the workforce, you're, you know, more expensive than the knowledge that you have, the real world knowledge that you have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's balance there. But I, I do anticipate at some point in the near future uh, applying to master's programs and getting some sort of an advanced degree and who knows, maybe even a PhD someday. Mm. Yeah, likewise. Uh, mainly, I don't think I'd ever go for a PhD. I don't know why. I just feel like... It's a lot of extra work. Yeah, yeah. it's too much work. <laughs> Maybe I'm just lazy, but... Uh, no, no, no. It's, 
<laughs> takes a special type of somebody. Yeah, okay. definitely. I think it does. And, and my, my wife does. She, she wants to do that. And mm. I'm like, that's awesome. But for me, I, I've thought about getting a, an MBA, actually. Um, and especially some companies will actually help you pay for it. So, I mean, that, that's always a plus if you do happen to, to be a part of a company that does. But um, definitely, I'd say the learning never stops, no matter where you are, as long as you don't let it stop. And so, uh, I mean, I've also heard others give the advice that you really, after about five years or so, a lot of the time might start feeling stagnant in, if you're at the same, same job. And I don't know if that's like a, a hard and fast rule. It pr- probably, you know, don't take my word for it. But um, so I've heard some say that, you know, it's good to move on and move to different companies here and there um, every five or so years so that you can get a new perspective and maybe refresh your determination to learn because there's, there's always more opportunities out there if you are aware of them. Maybe get a boost in your salary too as you jump from place to place. That's never a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, Matt and Don, I'm, I want to be very mindful of your work-life balance here. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. Um, but uh, before I let you guys go, I just want to ask you, uh, besides the internships and paying more attention in your calculus classes, is there any kind of advice that you would give current engineering students on how to pre- better prepare um, for a career in engineering? My biggest advice, and I touched on it earlier, yeah. was learn a programming language mm. of some kind. Learn how to think about how you think, think about how you are solving the problem, and teach a computer to do it. Because there's so much that you can get off of your plate, so much of the little fish that are just taking up your time that you can you can spend, you can better spend that time fishing for big fish. Um, I think that's very important and just know what you're talking about. And if you're not the expert, let the expert talk. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the smartest people say the least. That's one thing I've realized and it's know, just know where you fit in the puzzle. Yeah, I'd say Learn the soft skills. I'd say that's that's probably the biggest advice I can think of because for myself, it's made a huge difference. I actually recently read uh, the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and it made a huge difference for me because I never realized how much those little nuances of how to talk with someone, how to get them on your side, not in a manipulative way, but as a, as a friend, uh, just getting to know people and um, showing them you know, it doesn't really know how, it doesn't matter how much you know. If, if people know how much you care, then it just really makes all the difference. And so I'd say that's one big thing that I've seen help me. And I think it could help others as well. Just learning those soft skills, dealing with people and, and treating them with respect and, and care. And you'll see the difference Mm. that those relationships make. So you'd recommend that, that book? That particular book being yeah. a good starting point because yeah. my next question was going to be how how do people get those soft skills if we're not providing them or, or not helping provide them here at college? Yeah, so. absolutely. I actually listened to the audio book as I went to and from work, so it didn't even take me any extra time. I, I literally was just listening to it as I went to and from work, and um, you know, you'd be surprised how much of a difference it makes because you really do. Um, underestimate sometimes how much people will respect and, and like you if you just treat them well, you know? Well, it's also easy for people our age to try to do everything through the computer screen, right? That's how we grew up. Mm-hmm. And I can tell you there are so many problems that I've come against that were solved in like five minutes because I went and talked to somebody about it. So true. Absolutely. It would have been... 10 emails going back and forward. It would have been, you know, 30 text messages or, you know, three phone calls or just go over there and talk to guys. Say, hey, I'm, you see my numbers? They're this way. Yours are this other way. Oh, yeah, we'll figure it out. Five minutes later, it's solved. The problem's gone. 
So instead of spending three hours writing emails back and forward and thinking, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, you can go there and see that point of view and have a back and forth and come to a solution that way. So it, don't ever be afraid to go and talk to somebody as opposed to, you know, sending an email or a text message or leaving a voicemail. And I, I think even just to add to that, in, in my classes, I remember a lot of the time sitting in my chair, first day of class, and talking to no one and just literally just waiting for the professor to come in, taking the notes, leaving. And eventually, you know, they'd require us with some kind of group related work to talk to some people and I'd do the bare minimum. But I mean, just developing relationships with your fellow students and with professors, I mean, it, it makes a big difference because you kind of naturally pick up on those things as well, those, those soft skills as you just practice, basically. Mm. Well, Matt and Don, I, I really want to thank you both for uh, coming down here today and, and having this conversation. It's wonderful to see that you both are doing well. Um, I hope that your work-life balance, uh, you can work on that, Matt. But, um, <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying very hard. <laughs> very hard. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, high school students or uh, college students can benefit from the advice that you gave today. Thank you, guys. Hope so. Welcome. Thanks for having us on. Thank you. I would like to again thank Matt and Don for sharing their experiences with me. Matt mentioned the importance of learning a programming language and recommended Excel VBA in particular. In case you are interested in learning VBA, a few years back I developed a free, not for credit, online course titled Introduction to Excel VBA, which focuses on the fundamentals of VBA programming in Excel. If you are interested in taking this course, I have provided a link in the comments section. I also would like to thank Cesar Moreno for helping record and edit this podcast, as well as Cal Poly Pomona for providing funding for this podcast pilot project. If you enjoyed this episode, you can support it by leaving comments wherever you heard the podcast and letting friends and family know about the podcast. Goodbye for now.